above 2 lakhs you know sales volumes just drop off the cliff royal enfield is working on a new accessible 250 cc motorcycle hybrids bring weight and weight is always something you associate with royal enfield the first proof of uh, something different yet retaining to its core of the past has been the uh, the first images of the electric motorcycle that we've seen if you look online the biggest complaints are not with the way the bike is bed but more with the service network Welcome to the Autocar Deep Drive podcast powered by Kotak Mahindra Prime. Now, a lot of you have been asking for a bike podcast, so that's what we're going to do today. I'm Rishad Modi, this is Ketan Thakkar, and since this is our first bike podcast, we decided to start with something really exciting. Ketan, what's the big news? Thank you, Rishad. Yeah, uh, let's get into the exciting world of Royal Enfield. Uh, you know, the company has been in an overdrive. Uh, you know, you heard about so many different bikes coming in. Uh, the big news uh, we have for our uh, uh, viewers uh, is that Royal Enfield is working on a new accessible 250 cc motorcycle. Uh, the project has been um, under discussion for almost seven to eight years. Uh, clearly, with vehicle prices moving up, uh, the step up to Royal Enfield is becoming more and more difficult uh, for a lot of entry premium buyers. So Royal Enfield realizes that uh, you know, despite adding so many more models, uh, if you were to really look at their monthly volumes, they've been averaging at around seventy odd thousand. Uh, yes, uh, the bigger motorcycles have given them a little bit of volume in the international market, but it's still very uh, limited volumes in India. So they really needed something uh, like a classic uh, that can actually take the volume to the next stage. And what we understand, the platform is called Platform B. Uh, it has been given a go ahead internally. Uh, early days, uh, maybe a teaser. Uh, there may be a plug-in hybrid on a 250cc because of the smaller displacement. Uh, there is a discussion, but at least we know that at least on the ice front, uh, the 250cc has been given a go-ahead, and hopefully in another two to three years' time, we should be able to see that motorcycle on road. Awesome. You know, this news has been out, like you said, for about seven, eight years now, and back then it made no sense because 250 from Royal Enfield just did not compute. I think the company is very different today to what they were then. Since the 650s came out, their whole impression has changed. The kind of products they're making, modern products like the liquid cool platform. So today, a 250 fits in. The other reason it fits in is because pre BS6, uh, pre BS around BS4 time, their entry point was about 1.2 lakh rupees. Today is gone. Today almost. the bullet is 1.7. The Hunter is the most affordable bike. So they need something affordable. They need to bring people back into the brand. Most of their products, including a bunch of the classic range as well, is 2 lakhs and above. Right. And that's a steep price point. I mean, above 2 lakhs, you know sales volumes just drop off the cliff. So Royal Enfield needs something and a 250 really makes sense. Absolutely. You know, and and uh, we saw over the last four years, uh, uh, the product action from the company has been unabated. And they've created a new segment. Uh, they've gone back to their old heritage into their... Uh, uh, you know, uh, past glory of bringing in new kind of, I mean, classic retro kind of motorcycles. Uh, we saw with Hunter, they tried to do something new, something different. Uh, I'm hoping that, you know, I mean, uh, the 250cc motorcycle uh, will try and do something different, something new. Uh, so far, they've relied on their retro as a core offering. Uh, I'm hoping to see, I mean, the Gorilla's... Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, is another offering that is going to be appealing to a larger audience. So I'm I'm hoping that the 250cc will actually be that big shift uh, that the company has been waiting for for a while to get to the next level. So it will basically be a, a relatively simple motorcycle. It's not going to be liquid-cooled like the 450s, as I understand. And it won't be a classic sort of motorcycle. It'll be more of a roadster, more yeah. in the line of a slightly more modern, younger motorcycle. They want to bring young people into the brand. Is that is that a is that a good assumption? You know, like you mentioned, uh, Rashad, how the prices have moved up, and that's a constant conversation within the company as to how can they be more relevant to a larger audience. Uh, we are a young country, and average age, given the rising population, is becoming younger and younger. And if you were to look at their past portfolio, the average age used to be in the range of 35 to 40 years. With the Hunter, they cracked the code, and they could. Uh, uh, bring in a lot of young buyers. But unfortunately for them, Hunter was actually eating into Classic and uh, Super Meteor. So, uh, you know, there's constant discussion within the company. How can we be more accessible? How can the step up to Royal Enfield be more easier? And hence, the air-cooled engine uh, is what our preliminary understanding is. And hence, the idea would be to offer a motorcycle that is not too much of a leap uh, for an entry premium buyer uh, uh, to get into a Royal Enfield fold. And so, 
one can expect it to be a roadster like you mentioned. Uh, one can expect it to be a lot more accessible and one can expect it to hopefully bring in a lot of incremental volumes. So at the drawing board, the approval has uh, been given. Now the company will start engaging with its uh, uh, you know vendors. By then you'll know the potential opportunity that the uh, model may have. So clearly in the past, company has mentioned that the mid-size for them starts from 250 and we always ask them, you know, when is the 250 coming? So clearly now the decision has been taken and hopefully, uh, you know, they will be able to create another classic. So how far away? Uh, the, the, it's on the drawing board right now. Uh, the team in UK has started uh, developing that. Uh, in fact, the, the facilities in UK are getting doubled uh, as we speak. Uh, there are so many new motorcycles, uh, form factors coming in from Royal Enfield. So the capability building is happening, platform development, engineering work will happen now and very soon, hopefully within a year's time, they'll start engaging with the ecosystem. And uh, maybe say another three years time, uh, we'll have uh, a Royal Enfield 250. Uh, you know, Siddharth Lal has always been a believer in staying the course and taking it one step at a time. So you can expect they, they, they are never in hurry, uh, just like they are uh, motorcycling, yeah. uh, you know, you know, relaxed uh, uh, but in a pleasing way. So he will, he will want to ensure that the motorcycle is done right. Uh, but good part uh, to know is that finally there is a go-ahead given. So uh, there are going to be many more REs hopefully in the future. But Ketan, before we move forward, you mentioned a plug-in hybrid. Yes, yes, Rishal. Please elaborate. Uh, so, I mean, uh, companies, you know, gainfully deploying the money that it's making into uh, disruptive future technologies. Uh Electrification, as we know, and management time and again has said that, you know, market is still not ready yet. You know, it is for the future. Uh, similarly, there are multiple alternate uh, powertrains that the company is working on. Uh, uh, there is a concept, so to say, on uh, 250, given the, you know, engine size is smaller. If there is a way in which they can fit in a battery and make in a plug-in hybrid out of it. It is more of a test project right now, but clearly when such kind of test happens, there is a thought behind it. Uh, they are. They, they've definitely uh, showcased the flex fuel, um, you know, ethanol. Uh, they're not going the gas way, of course, for the form factor that it is. Gas won't make sense. Uh, make sense. But uh, it is one of the interesting concepts. I'm very curious if the 250 franchise were to build into something really massive. I think that plug-in hybrid may eventually turn out to be a differentiator, which will, which will be very hard for others to, uh, you know, uh, copy. Uh, but again, you know, it'll call for a lot of proper tuning, engineering, development. So it's a test project at this point in time, but something, you know, that they are... a lot of engineering work in there because hybrids bring weight and weight is always something you associate with Royal Enfield. So I, I think, I think, I, so I'd love to see how they manage that. I, I think it's also, they're, uh, <clears throat> they're also cognizant of the CO2 footprint. And I think plug-in hybrids in that sense allows you to have a lesser CO2 footprint. So it's also about being a good corporate uh, a citizen. Uh, and how they can clean up the environmental, the electrification wave really hits the uh, two-wheeler space. So it's one of the initiatives. I mean, that also speaks volumes about how company really thinks long-term. We we are used to hearing Japanese talking about 20 years, but, you know, it is Siddharth Lal's uh, knack of looking really long-term uh, and working towards it. And even with the EVs, like you mentioned, First, he mentioned about it in 2018, and uh, we're going to be having the first electric motorcycle in 24, 25. Uh, so clearly, they're thinking long term. Uh, it's an interesting project. Uh, my bet is 60, 40, they will bring it in the market, but it's a test project. We should right. get it right. So nothing we know for sure, but something interesting in the world. Oh, absolutely. Now let's talk about volumes. You and I study them every month. Right. It's been stagnant. It hasn't really dropped. It hasn't really climbed. The pandemic has gone by, supply has more or less sorted out. Sorted out. Why is RE still stagnant? Now, I guess uh, it's about getting the getting into the psyche of the youth, if you really were to ask me. Uh, and my question is whether the youth is really interested in retro bikes. Uh, and hence, uh, you know, Hunter actually uh, broke the mold in, in a sense. And, and that's how they actually saw a lot of young buyers coming in. And while you're you know, you have a hundred over hundred years history, and there there is so much in uh, so much of uh, uh, you know glorious past that you have that you can always dip into. But I think today's youth really needs and wants something new, clutter breaking, something different, something innovative. And uh, I mean, if the lessons were learned from the hunter, hopefully we'll have different form factors. I think the first proof of 
uh, something different yet retaining to its core of the past has been the uh, the first images of the electric motorcycle that we've seen. You know, it's something that is still core uh, to their past yet at the same time wanting to be a little different uh, to appeal to the youth. I think the initial images look very appealing and there have been a lot of questions by friends as well. You know, I mean, when is the uh, electric motorcycle coming in India? Uh, it's still far away off, but I think it's got, to, it's got to be about appealing to the sensibilities of the youth uh, and what exactly do they want. Uh, that, that's been my understanding. I don't know what, what, what you feel. It's, to me, it's a sign of RE evolving. Uh, I remember we were the first in the world to break the story that they were going to do an electric bike. And I got that from an interview with Sid Lal on the sidelines of the Interceptor launch at Aikma in 2018 or 2017, if I'm wrong. It was a really long time ago. And when he said it, it just did not make sense to write. But again, today it seems to fit into what Ari is. And when you look at it, there's this really nice blend of retro. It's clearly retro themed, goes back to Ari's heritage. But there's a lot of interesting things happening on it. If you look at the image, you see the frame actually goes over where the fuel tank would be. No one does that. Right. It's got a girder style front suspension, which is, you'd see bike from the 1930s and 40s. It's a cool looking thing. And I w I'm really intrigued to see what this Ari electric bike turns out to be. You know, it's based on that flying flea concept. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, the yeah. bikes used to be during yeah. World War II dropped down from uh, the aircraft onto uh, the war field, I think. And I mean, it's retained that concept. And I mean, they love bringing back names from the past. Yeah, absolutely. so maybe this will be the flying Philly. We don't, we don't know. We'll have to see. No, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, one thing which I feel uh, Rishad has been very uh, compelling from a, a Royal Enfield perspective is the way they've. Uh, ran ahead of competition by miles and uh, I think uh, the strength that brand has today uh, has ensured that there is so much more that we can see in the future. It's probably amongst the most profitable motorcycle manufacturer in the world. The entire world is looking at that segment and that brought uh, Triumph and uh, Harley into the Indian market. Uh, uh, the capacities of over a million, they, I think they account for almost half of mid-sized motorcycle uh, share in the world, uh, frugal engineering, and there's so much more that's happening with the company. I just hope and feel that, you know, there is a need to have something differentiated, something uh, clutter-breaking, something that breaks the mold uh, in order for Royal Enfield to actually have that, uh, you know, next big leap uh, into the Indian market or global market. You know, you talked about Triumph and Harley coming in. We said that Royal Enfield is stagnating, and they are. They're 65 to 75, 80,000 years a month. But we are not considering that between the Honda 350s, between the Classic Legends motorcycles, uh, between the new Harley and the Triumphs, those bikes are accounting for 10 to 12,000 units a month. And most of those units have come from Royal Enfield. Absolutely. So they are stable despite that. And I think yeah, that's, that's, something, that's something to think about as well. Now, I find it really almost overwhelming how much RE is doing right now. They are building a new factory in India. Yes. They are building factories overseas. Yes. They are expanding their UK infrastructure. They are getting into electric. We have reported they're doing a new 440 that will replace the 410. Right. We have reported that they're going to do a bigger engine to the 650 sometime in the future. Right. We have reported that updated 350s are coming. We have reported that the classic <laughs> 650 is coming. Uh, scram the 650. There's so much... Do you think they're doing too much? Yeah, I mean, plate is full and overflowing. I think organizationally, they're definitely uh, significantly stretched. And that's the reason why you have a separate setup for electric vehicle business uh, in short span of just about 18 to 24 months. Uh, uh, they have a dedicated team of over 700 people. And it's a completely different business. It, it's, it's a completely different business. And I think it makes sense. Uh, uh, I mean, they need that sharper uh, focus on the electric vehicle business. Uh, clearly, the market is still not there. Uh, they are, in a way, uh, looking at, uh, you know, uh, some bright spots there or early adopters who would want to get into uh, an electric motorcycle. Uh, so clearly, the brand is going to be different. The team is different. Uh, I think customer interface will be different. Uh, the and, and and you probably may have a different uh, showrooms as well. A decision is yet to be taken. But clearly, we have people coming in from likes of Ducati and uh, some of the other global names uh, who are driving the uh, uh, EV business. So yes, EV is one part of it. There's going to be a dedicated factory for EV. Plus, there are multiple new platforms. And sometimes I really wonder, uh, I mean, in, in car business, we do say that, you know, it's always important to leverage vehicle architectures and engine architectures. I really do feel that, you know, 
uh, I mean, is it little too much? Uh, I mean, and I don't know, you'll be able to help me understand that, whether an Indian consumer, whether do they have the sensibilities of distinguishing between a roadster, a classic, a bobber? Uh, I mean, wh how I see it as a layman is that I have a budget in mind. Um, and uh, yes, I want to own something premium and something that is uh, you know, standing out in the market. But it's it's a lot of confusion there. I mean, yeah. I mean, like you mentioned, 350, 440, uh, 650, there's 750, there's 250. Now, and there are going to be the various form factors in yeah. that. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, I think there 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 definitely needs to be uh, more clarity uh, going ahead. I think they'll have about twenty different vehicles on sale eventually. Yeah, which, absolutely. Yeah. Which is something similar to Hero and Honda, and it's it's unusual to see a premium brand in India do that. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they pull that off. Will there be oversaturation? Will people be able to distinguish? To that question, I think the Indian buyer is really evolving. Social media has brought us up to date with more, thing, you know, more ideas of motorcycling. What motorcycling can be in different ways, right. you know, different flavors of motorcycling. So, definitely getting more discerning. But we are also a very unique market in that it's not so much about the category but about the product. Right. Some products just click. The greatest example is Classic 350. It is the bike that has made Royal Enfield what it is today. Right. But there are other examples as well as, you know, we're not a sports bike market. It's plainly obvious. But the Yamaha R15 is this anomaly that stands out and yeah. sells 10 to 12,000 units a month, despite being a 2 lakh rupee 150cc bike. Absolutely. So there are certain brands that become bigger than a category in India. And right. Royal Enfield already has that. They would love to create more of that. But how many can they do? That? I, I, I wonder. No, I mean, uh, and uh, to, to that point, I think in the Indian two-wheeler market, we've seen Hero is known for its excellence in mass market motorcycle. Uh, the endeavors to get into more scooters, more premium motorcycle has had a very limited sort of impact uh, to the company's fortunes. Similarly, Bajaj has kind of ruled the roost when it comes to the entry premium and premium motorcycle space with KTM and Husqvarna actually helping the brand reinforcing its presence in the market. Uh, TVS is probably one of the outliers who actually tries to play across uh, the segment. And again, I always feel from TVS Motors' perspective that, you know, they're spread too thin. But uh, uh, I think they have hero models in each of in the various seg segments. Uh, yeah. So they have the Jupiter, uh, then they have the Apache. Uh, Dronin has been a sort of a limited success. I uh, uh, iCube is doing very well. So I think uh, uh, it's not an easy act to kind of, uh, you know, to have the appeal across segments and given the sharp focus that Royal Enfield has of 250 to 750, I think this is way too much clutter. Uh, I mean, yes, it's okay to kind of leverage the vehicle architecture and engine architecture, but uh, sometimes I feel there is need for rationalization and maybe, or maybe just like Hero and Bajaj and uh, Yamaha, uh, they'll have their Hero products mm -hmm. and rest of the portfolio will actually attuned to the sensibilities of select few niches. Supporting characters. Uh, supporting characters yeah. in their portfolio. So, I mean, in 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 no span of time, they're already going to be, I mean, this year's target is about a million. Uh, they think that global is another million. Hasn't that been the target for a few years? Yeah, it has been the target. And uh, I think uh, uh, that's the reason why this year, I think probably this is going to be the most uh, active year from Royal Enfield in the sense. I mean, there are about half a dozen new models and I think credit to them to ensure that they are constantly upgrading their existing right. products. I mean, uh, uh, I heard about the J platform. I mean, the first J platform model came not too long back and they already have updates coming on that. So clearly, company is not sitting still. Company is ensuring that they are uh, moving uh, the products to the sensibilities or the needs of the Indian buyers. Uh, the, the new bullet, I understand, has not really got off to a grey star in its strong bastions of Punjab and Haryana and company has proactively uh, resorted to some measures there. Uh, there are going to be different kind of tail lights and different treatment to the exhaust, on their uh, exhaust uh, that is going to be brought in. So you got to give credit to the company when it comes to agility. Uh, uh, but sometimes I really wonder, you know, does it lead to a loss of focus? Um, so, I mean, yes, a lot happening, a very active here. And uh, one can expect with a 20 model portfolio, uh, I think uh, uh, a million should happen. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, this year, their target is a million uh, with so many more models coming in. But the first few months, I think it has been slow. Uh, it, it is going to be a tall ask for the company to meet its a million target. Uh, the globalization... Uh, uh, that is the question I have for you, actually. Yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Well, well, so, my question is, 
they've making they've been making bikes that are great for international markets super meteor shotgun these seem more appropriate for international markets than our own the new himalayan is proving to be very popular overseas why aren't their export numbers growing very significantly now it's i think got to do with the entire global economic scenario uh, so they've done all the right things uh, they've had assembly bases at right places uh, they're setting up offices i think they now have an office in europe uh, they have an office in uh, southeast asia thailand is a big base uh, they've been uh, i think very interestingly uh, unlike uh, carpet bombing the entire country they've gone uh, uh, with a city approach they chose bangkok to begin with and i think they are Uh, choosing their battles right and similarly they are approaching it uh, around the world so i think uh, they've seeded those markets and we've known that it's very hard to build a brand in a market where uh, in north america or for instance where harley davidson is a habit uh, or for that matter triumph in uh, the uk so it's going to be it's going to take a lot of effort and you've got to be local uh, in those markets so i think to begin with they've set up bases to ensure that the cost factors are addressed uh the offices are there and i think they're going to be hiring local people that will ensure that you know royal enfield gets the local uh, you know voices right i think when the uk tc came up uh, one of the big thing that we heard from sadat lal was to understand the uh, the international customers and i think uh, there are teams which travel around the world and they've been listening to the customer it's just got to do with uh, the economic overlying economic factor i think the russia ukraine crisis has impacted yeah. the the european market uh, the uh, uh, american market is very hard market to crack and again uh, the mid size or the smaller displacement motorcycles are very small in number so it, our royal enfield in a way will have to kind of put in the hard yards of creating that category or the segment in the market in rest of the emerging markets i think uh, they are very similar to india so they are ripe for upgrade and i think it's about just ensuring that they introduce the models at the same time that they introduce in india i think for that matter i mean look at for example super meteor super meteor came in the indian market about 18 months back but it's making its way into the overseas market i mean just now so i think timing the entry into into international market is going to be critical just like india the emerging markets are also very demanding they are very aware they are very connected uh, i think it's just got to do with uh, you know going to ground zero building the fundamentals and i think they've taken all the right measures yes i mean last year was hard uh, but the flip side to that is uh, during difficult times you know people tend to choose more affordable options and that is where actually That's in a way it is going right yeah uh, in a way uh, that mid size motorcycle actually gets into a sweet spot and that's something that we heard from triumph guys as well you know some of the office goers want to use triumph to work the smaller uh, triumphs the 400 cc triumph so i think that's a market uh, you know more frugal approach uh, you know for office use more um so i mean you're going to see you're going to see different kind of buyers coming in it's been hard uh, but i mean it's 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 a, it's a journey that they'll have to traverse it's going to it took them almost 15 20 years to kind of reach yeah. i mean uh, they used to do about 50 or 1000 in 2010 and once the momentum starts then it it's very hard to stop and uh, like you said it's sometimes it's just about getting into uh, finding that right sweet spot that uh, you know that Uh, that pleases uh, the buyer you know the reason i asked you is because everything seems to line up for them overseas they have proven their products a lot of their bikes are really appreciated and already have a fan following overseas so it's that is a big deal for an indian manufacturer to have achieved that already then there's a fact that so many international markets are going through a hard time in terms of financial recession etc stuff like that so everything seems to be right for royal enfield to explode overseas and i truly believe that in the long run a big chunk of the business is going to be outside of india i mean i don't know rishad i mean i'd like to understand from you i think leisure motorcycling per se has been associated with those big bulky bikes yeah. in the past right i mean and that is where royal enfield is trying to offer something which is more accessible uh, uh, uh lighter more easier and also appeals to the uh, uh, larger demographic including women uh so i think it's also about the habit change more probably breaking the mold or breaking the clutter i keep using that word again and again uh, so i i don't know whether the leisure motor cycling which has been associated with those big bikes whether that i mean they'll find royal enfield to be their ideal uh, uh, you know alternative happening and there's a few reasons for that one motorcyclists worldwide are aging there aren't as many new ones coming in as there are going out which is an unfortunate thing and everyone is trying to change that the other thing is that by definition of evolution the big bikes are getting bigger and more expensive right today anything premium big adventure bike sports bikes they're all 20000 euros a pounds plus which is a lot of money 
So again, there is so much scope for simple, middleweight, well-made, fun to ride motorcycles, and that's why I think Ari has. Yeah, I think I think I think in the past, Sadat has mentioned about how those big bikes are actually out of bounds of many of the yeah. people who actually want to experience motorcycling. And so in that sense, it actually fits that uh, uh, market really well. Uh, uh, you know, so I mean. Uh, and big bikes at the end of the day, they're also gas guzzling. Uh, they have that carbon footprint on the environment. Uh, yes, electrification is not something that is spoken quite often in the two-wheeler space, but there is the stress on the environment. And I mean, and uh, a smaller ICE engine is still uh, lesser of a pressure on the environment than big gas guzzling uh, one, two-liter motorcycles yeah. that uh, we've seen from the likes of Harley and Indian and uh, Triumph in the past, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's so many things aligned for Ari. I think they're going to be global superstars. They're on the right track. In a couple of days, I am flying to Spain to ride their new Gorilla. That is going to open a completely new segment for them, bring in new buyers. How much of a success it will be initially and how fast that will grow, we need to see in India. But a lot of exciting things to come. No, I mean, and what I've been thinking about Royal Enfield is that when will the next big leap come? So hopefully, I mean, the V motor, V platform or uh, the 250cc motorcycle is still about three years away. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, I mean, there's a lot of effort being put into uh, re-energize the classic franchise. Uh, there's going to be uh, a classic 650. There's Go and Classic that is lined up. There's an updated classic that's coming up. Um, but I'm still very curious to see a different form of motorcycle from Royal Enfield. And I'm also very intrigued to know what will the R platform, the 750cc, uh, would do uh, for Royal Enfield. I'd like to understand from you, Rashad, how has been the initial uh, four or five years for the Interceptor and the Continental GT been with the 650cc motorcycle? Uh, when they launched uh, uh, you know, 1920, if I'm not wrong, uh, you know, the premise was that a lot of 450 or 350 and 500 buyers will actually grow into yeah. uh, the Interceptor and Continental GT. But the volume still continues to remain small. So what's been your assessment? Uh, whether, uh, I mean, do the Interceptors and GT have it in them to be a lo larger uh, franchise just like how Classic has been in the past? Or it's still too much of a steep jump, especially in a market like India, while they may be more relevant overseas. I think we are still getting up public at large to accept 2 lakh rupees as a point that's fair to spend on a bike. You see people spend huge amounts of money on cars. The fact that the Alto is no longer the best-selling car still frazzles my mind. I mean, it's Bellinos and Swifts are the best-selling cars in the country right. today. They're expensive cars. People are okay to spend 10, 15 lakhs on a car, but they're still not okay to spend, and people in volume, right. uh, in big money on bikes, because bikes are still seen as a sort of selfish, personal thing. It's not a family-oriented thing. It's not so much of a prestige thing as a car is. And I think that is going to be the way going forward for a while. I don't think the 650s and the 750s can ever be huge volume products for near to midterm in India. I still think it's going to be small capacity motorcycles. The classic is very important. It's a good thing they're upgrading it. It brings in refreshing things, uh, small feature upgrades, new colors, things like that. To me, the next big thing is the 250. It, it's logically that is the next big thing for Royal Enfield in terms of big volumes. But I mean, just to touch upon the point of motorcycling as a culture, I mean, I think uh, you've got to give credit to Royal Enfield for ensuring uh, there are hundreds of thousands of rides that happen yeah. around the country. Uh, but what I understand from ground zero is that, I mean, there is no lack of desirability to own a, a Royal Enfield, but somewhere they struggle in that funnel from desirability to consideration and consideration to actually closure of sale. So, when you say Royal Enfield, you know, there's definitely a positive connotation there. Uh, and the motorcycling culture, uh, I mean, they're trying very hard. So, I mean, I, I would like to understand from you, uh, the entire motorcycling culture in this country, uh, which is predominantly a mass market. Yes, we've seen, you know, a lot of new models. I, be, I believe in the uh, 200cc and about, there have been almost about 20 to 25 new offerings that have entered the market. What do you think about motorcycling as a culture? And I mean, I've heard about different kind of uh, one-make races, uh, you know, there's talk of electric uh, motorcycle race, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, sports bike races. I mean, I just, just want to understand from the entire consumer standpoint, I mean, how do you see motorcycling per se evolving in the country? I don't think anyone has done anything more for motorcycling than Royal Enfield in India as a culture. They have really grown it, made it huge. 
the fact that their festival in Goa is bigger than the India Bike Week wow. itself says everything about how much they have generated in terms of motorcycle culture evolution. My idea of motorcycling culture in India is that we are not a high performance culture. We haven't had the heritage. We haven't grown up as three and five year olds on go kart tracks racing around or you know becoming off road stars. That is growing. We do have great talents coming out of India. Harit Noah has done superbly yes. at the Dakar last year. It was unbelievable. That top ten, amazing. But uh, we are not that country. We have growing e- efforts in racing. Royal Enfield themselves are running a great series with the Continental GT. But I believe our culture is in touring, in road riding. Right. And again, Royal Enfield is in the right place for that. Right. So right. they they are well placed. But I mean, uh, I also feel from a challenge standpoint, and uh, this is one question that I've been asking uh, a lot of friends in the industry about: When will the next big leap from Royal Enfield come from? Uh, you know, uh, yes, uh, you know, there's effort being put in, uh, put on the electrification and the alternative path train. Uh, there are platform strategies being defined. I think uh, uh, how can they resonate with a larger audience? To me, uh, the big question is. Can a retro core company appeal to the larger Indian youth? Uh, and to me, uh, if uh, the Indian user is so keen on riding on streets with the sports bike, with the roadsters, I mean, is there a need for Royal Enfield to do a lot more for that audience? I mean, that, that, that I don't think they ever will. They've been very clear that we are simple, what they call pure motorcycling. I don't think they will ever make a sport sports bike. They may make a sporty motorcycle right. like the Continental GT is, and they have history of this as well. I mean, they've done 250s in the past. There are 250s from the 1950s and 60s that Royal Enfield have done. Uh, some of them were making as much as 18 and 19 horsepower in those days. Uh, they had a Continental GT 250. Right. So it's not like they won't make sporty motorcycles, but they won't make a sports bike. Right. I think they have made that abundantly clear. So, do you think the youth will be interested in this form of motorcycle? I mean, the the, the kind of uh, uh, the family that Royal Enfield offers. It's it's an interesting question because who knew that Royal Enfield could be this big in the first place? Right. So, how much more is there to grow? Uh, I don't know. I feel like the classic market is already unnaturally large. Mm. How much bigger can it get? Or does Royal Enfield go into another direction to find that growth? Right. That's something I think that. The the form factor of the 250 will give us the answer to what Royal Enfield believes. Right. Is right. And, and and I agree with you. I think Siddharth has been uh, reiterating this fact again and again uh, that uh, you know uh, they are going to have that sharp focus. They are kind of motorcycle, uh, and they will reinvent, keep reinventing. And I think the large profits that they make, they are actually redeploying it very well. Uh, be it on platforms, be it on uh, form factors, be it on global expansion. And I think there is definitely a need to do a lot more on ground zero in terms of uh, the confusion that is there at my end. I think a lot of consumers may also have that confusion. So probably realigning the dealers and the workforce at the dealership that once a prospective buyer hits the showroom with so much of of offering that is there in the showroom, how can you ensure that this one's for, uh, for this customer, it's a classic for the other customer, it's a... Um, you know, a super meteor or for that matter, future 750. And that's going to be a big challenge for them because you, on normal considerations, their huge network is a positive. But right. here, their huge network is going to be a challenge. How do you train 2,000 plus dealers Absolutely. across the country to distinguish and get that distinguishment across to the customer, you know, to let them know? Uh, you know, one thing that uh, uh, has caught my fancy and, uh, you know, I mean, we were brought up with these stories about, uh, you know, leaking... Uh, uh, fuel tanks and uh, you know niggles on suspension and uh, you know there are every once in a while stray incidents of uh, sashi breaking uh, help me understand right. uh, you know while there's a lot of emphasis and effort that has gone in ensuring you know uh, the niggles or the issues more uh, in the motorcycle receipt what's been your assessment of the quality of motorcycling uh, that uh, Royal Enfield has uh, delivered over the last four or five years. You're absolutely right. They have a rich history of mechanical issues and build quality issues and things that I, they have really been working on steadily. But for me, the huge change came from the new J platform bikes. Uh, the 650s were the first example that Royal Enfield can make a very well-engineered, well-manufactured motorcycle. 
But the 350s, they completely changed it. I was not a fan of the old motorcycles. I did not understand them. I didn't understand the appeal of them. And today, I'm really fond of the classic 350. I think it's a wonderful bike. But the bigger thing there is how well these bikes are made and how stringently they are tested and engineered. Uh, you will not hear of engine failures, things like that anymore. Royal Enfield really puts in a crazy amount of work into making sure the bikes are well made. Are they completely perfect? No. Almost no bike is. There has been the very unfortunate case of the chassis breakages that happened in the Himalayan recently. We did a story on the website explaining why they happened according to what Royal Enfield told us. And it sort of makes sense because it's a stress member chassis. The engine bolts to the, uh, to the chassis through two main bolts, so very critical bolts. There's no cradle underneath on the new Himalayan. And Royal Enfield really complicated this process with the type of bolt that's required, the type of spacers that are required, the type of torque setting that is required. And the thing is, their accessory uh, crash guards are quite expensive. So, And the crash guard is the most common accessory on a Royal Enfield. So what many customers went, ended up doing is going to aftermarket options. And some of these weren't properly designed for that because the aftermarket guys probably weren't aware that this was so critical. Right. And because of poor torque settings, because of poorly installed uh, bolts, it was sending unnatural stresses to other parts of the frame. And we've seen computational an analytics from Royal Enfield's test data showing how these stresses move yeah. through the chassis and concentrate at one particular area. Over time, it can lead to chassis failures. We know of two incidences, there may be more. Royal Enfield seems to have taken care of it. My personal opinion is that it's, it shouldn't have happened. They know that their customers are going to do this. They know their customers are going to stick these things on there. They should have thought of it. They seem to be addressing it, but... That's an unfortunate thing, but in general, I it's a strange. Shouldn't it's a strange it's, it's, it shouldn't have happened, especially since it's such a sensitive topic with the Himalayan having had chassis failures in the previous gen model for different reasons. That was different. Uh, but have you seen issues with any other motorcycles? Uh, no, their not, earlier? not not no particular. In fact, if you look online, the biggest complaints are not with the way the bike is made, but more with the service network, and that is something across the country. It's hard to get quality work and to maintain that quality. And when Royal Enfield has over 2,000 outlets across the country, it's going to be especially hard to ensure Among that. Task. To me, that is the big challenge for them and every other manufacturer actually, to ensure a high quality experience at the service center. The thing in India is we are used to not spending a lot of money and as a result, we don't get a very high quality experience. Right. We need to find a better after sales experience and that's not just for Royal Enfield, I think it's for everybody. So it's a strange incident and so those, were, those were, we can't call them stray incidents because there are, I'm sure, many other bikes out there with those crash cards. But the company has tried to educate people about it. They say they're going to educate all their customers at the dealer level. They've come to us and we have put the story out there. So we've amplified the, the reasoning behind it. And I'm sure that everyone who buys a Himalayan now will be very cautioned at the dealer that do this, it's risky and you will probably lose your warranty if you put an aftermarket crash card. So they will sort the issue out. But I don't think they're solving the mechanical aspect of the issue. It's a little too complicated to solve. But if I were to put you in a spot, how would you rate them on quality and engineering at this point in time from the uh, issue? Engineering, absolutely, really very good. Quality of the product, very good. The after sales is the weak point and that needs to improve. Right, right. I think there's a lot of effort that needs to be done on ground zero, retraining the dealers. Probably I mean, there's a talk of having a different logo, a different brand. Uh, the electrification will be a completely different setup. So I think uh, I think uh, it's really strong. I think the, the big question to me is how can they move from desirability to much more larger audience? Yes, they are strong. Yes, they are leader by far. I think it's the next big leap is what I'm very curious to look forward to. And I think uh, just like you, I'm very curious. I think we will have to wait for three years to know. When the 250 comes out. Until that time, I think yeah. uh, uh, Royal Enfield will ensure that you'll continue to go on multiple Oh, they're keeping rides. us busy. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're keeping us busy. So there's a lot to look forward to. I think the Gorilla ride will be the first thing you see now. No, so exciting times ahead. And yeah. uh, I, I hope, uh, you know, we've been able to kind of give a lot more insight about the Royal Enfield yeah. brand uh, to our uh, viewers. And uh, it's been nice uh, chatting with yeah, you. We should do this more often. Yes, yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. Deep Drive will be back next Saturday at 11am as always so stay tuned and keep subscribed.